Good afternoon, everyone. This is our Louder Than Words series, and this is our last gathering for, for the year as we enter spring. We've had a remarkable series of conversations from public schools to policing, and, um, and I must say, with mixed emotions, this, this is a timely moment for us to talk about breaking the gun violence, the epidemic treating the disease, and, and gun violence happens to be a, a very topical moment for us in, in Seattle and, and King County. Um, my co-host here is, is Sally Clark, and we've, we've had a number of these conversations now, and Sally and I started this, this idea of having these, these conversations as a way to come back into the community after the pandemic and talk about some of those stubbornly persistent issues that are important to our community. And so this is one of the more important issues, I think, of our, of our time right now. Let me start by introducing Sally briefly. Sally serves as Interim Vice President for Campus Community Safety at the University of Washington. In that role, Sally works to make the University of Washington community preparedness, belonging, and accountability. And she has 10 years as a city council member also. So she is very deeply and intimately involved in this conversation in her day-to-day -day work. Dr. Deepika Neera is a board-certified general surgeon specializing in trauma and surgical critical care and assistant professor of surgery at Harborview Medical Center at the UW. She serves as the medical director of general surgery clinic at Harborview and the associate program director at surgical critical care and as a, and a fellowship at University of Washington. Um, so she's right in the heart of this, of this work. She's been at Harborview for three years. Dr. Frederick Rivara, the Seattle Children's Guild Association Endowed Chair in Pediatrics, Vice Chair and Professor of Pediatrics and Adjunct Professor of, of Epidemiology at UW. He is Editor-in-Chief of JAMA, Network Open, and Past Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. JAMA is Journal of American Medical Association. Right? Um, his career has been devoted to studying injury and injury prevention with over 35 years of firearms related research. He currently directs the Firearm Injury and Policy Research Program at the University of Washington. Again, no more important topic for us right now, um, firearm safety and injury prevention. So Sally, I'll turn to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. And uh, thank you to our guests for joining us on what is, uh, I think, there have been a couple of nice spring nights, uh, but when people uh, download this and see that there is sun streaming across and blinding Dr. Rivara, uh, <laughs> this is probably the best night so far of, of the spring. So we really appreciate everybody who's here, uh, and thanks for choosing to be indoors for us for an hour. It'll still be awesome when you get back outside. It'll be amazing. Uh, Ed, thank you very much for introducing <coughs> our talk tonight. Uh, we are here at Othello UW Commons, and I want to say two things at the start before I start peppering our guests here with, with questions. One is, uh, I, I should disclose that I'm uh, on a board member of a group called the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, so that's sort of a public, public disclosure of that connection that I have. I'm not here with that hat on tonight. I'm here with my University of Washington hat on and about uh, getting discussion of difficult issues and people who are trying to solve those difficult issues out into the, out into the world. Um, and I would also say um, these are hard discussions and uh, gun violence, um, some folks who are watching this or some folks who might be here tonight, you might be personally affected by this in your life in some way and so these are difficult discussions so we appreciate you, uh, we appreciate you being here tonight and we will have an opportunity to do Q&A as well. So I have a raft of questions that I'm going to throw at them but then uh, about halfway through this I will start looking around to see are there questions that folks who are here tonight would like to pose as well. Um, those can be questions that, uh, that you know now, or they can be ones that come to you later. You do not have to write them down in advance and hand them to anybody. We will actually trust you to speak into a microphone. Don't make us regret this. So, um, I will also note that we're here in Southeast Seattle. We're here uh, in the Othello neighborhood. Uh, old school people will know it as the New Holly neighborhood. We're just uh, north of Rainier Beach. We're just south of, of Columbia City, Hillman City. Genesee area. This is an area where um, several years ago it would have been probably associated more than some other areas of the city with gun violence, but I don't think we can say that anymore, actually. I don't think we can pick up the paper or, or I know a lot of you don't pick up the paper, I still pick up the paper, uh, or listen to the radio or, or hear the news and not hear about um, a gun violence incident that is 
um, up on Aurora or Capitol Hill or the U District, uh, unfortunately, and or West Seattle, just all over our region. And that um, further reinforces why we wanted to bring this into the Louder Than Words conversations tonight. Uh, I'm going to ask you both kind of how we start out with some of our guests, which is, who are you? Like, how did you get here? And you can answer this any way you'd like. Like, how did you, how did you end, up, end up in Seattle? How did you end up in the career you're in and why? Um, who wants to start? Go ahead, Vicky. I'll let you start. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, that is a tough question. Um, <laughs> So I was actually born in India, and when I was a few years old, we moved to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which was very different than very high idea. I grew up there, and then we moved to Melbourne, Australia, and I um, was in middle school and high school there. And then we moved to St. Louis, Missouri, which was a rough move as a junior in high school. Um, so I finished up there, went to college in Missouri, and I, at some point, realized that I wanted to practice medicine, and I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't really have mentors in the field, um, but I applied to medical school and got in. And um, I was at Stanford for medical school, and um, when I started out, I thought I wanted to be a neurologist, which um, is very different than trauma surgery. Um, and um, as I went through my clinical rotations, I just realized that I loved surgery, I loved the, the, the team mentality, I liked taking care of patients with problems that you could address by doing an operation and, and watching them get better. And I liked the relationship that you um, could build with patients um, in that. So um, I went to Boston, Massachusetts for a residency, which was seven years, um, and then I actually ended up in Seattle for the first time as a, as a trauma surgical critical care fellow. That was back in 2014. Um, and I fell in love with Seattle. Um, Harborview, the hospital I fell in, love, fell in love with. I wanted to spend some time in a limited resource environment and wanted to you know, experience that because I thought that would be an important part of, part of my sort of longer term career. And so I spent a year working in Uganda, um, doing general surgery and trauma surgery there and working on the trauma system there. I went back to Boston for a few years and then I came back to Seattle in 2019 and staff at Harborview. Okay. That's can quite you, a story. I'm yeah, can you do better than this? <laughs> so I grew up in New York and did my college and medical school back there and pediatric residency back there. And then I, after pediatric residency, I decided to join volunteer for the National Health Service Corps and ended up in a place called Hazard, Kentucky, which is in the middle of the East Kentucky coal fields. And I really learned about public health there. I learned about that to really influence the health of the population, you have to get out of the hospital, out of the clinic building, and work in the community. I saw um, all kinds of injuries there. Um, we had a big program. We had nurses go up and down the hollows and jeeps and help them to take care of babies. And after spending two years as a volunteer there, I decided to come out to Seattle and um, was admitted to something called the Clinical Scholars Program, which was funded by the Ronald Ray Johnson Foundation. He got a Master of Public Health degree here. And I started working on injuries at that point. I, had the fortune of running into a person named A. Bergman, who was a pediatrician at Children's. And he actually was one of the people that got the National Health Service Corps started um, and really got me more interested in the problem of injuries. And after that, I went and got a job in the faculty at the University of Tennessee in Memphis. But I really loved Seattle and during the time, two years I had been here. And um, Abe called me one day in 1984 and said, we want to start this injury prevention program and I want you to come back and run it. So I did. And so I've been here since October of 1984, almost 39 years now. And got very interested in the problem of injuries, injury prevention. And one of the early things that I worked on was, was firearm violence. Um, and one of the, well, I had the great fortune of working with a, a a um, wonderful researcher named Arthur Kellerman, who um, was a fantastic researcher. We did some studies funded by the CDC, 
in those studies um, were all looking at the association of having guns in a home and the risk of violent death. And they led to um, the Dickey Amendment, which was an amendment passed in 1996 that basically forbid the federal government from funding firearm research. A lot of people don't know that, but that, that was an important thing. And, and for long, I think there are a lot of people who are like, yeah, why don't we just know more about this stuff? And there's a big reason that we don't know right. more about this stuff, because for how long? It's from 1996 to about three years ago. The federal three government was ago. not allowed to invest in any kind of firearm research, yes. firearm health-related research. Yes. Which is fascinating. Yeah. And it was, a lot of it had to do with the studies that we did here and yeah. elsewhere around the country. People didn't like those studies. The NRA didn't like those studies. No, no. And they yeah. actually tried to do a lot of sort of nasty things, but fortunately, um, we were continue, we were able to continue on. And Seattle really was the first um, local government in the country to actually fund firearm research. Mm, wow. And I think you're on the council of that. I think I voted for that. Mm -hmm. Indeed. No, my, yeah, my, my colleague and, and friend, uh, council member and, and former interim mayor, Tim Burgess, Tim Burgess. Uh, big, big proponent of that and really saw that, that uh, problem of no money being able to go right. into the research. And we had such great people at Harborview like, wait a minute, why don't we, why don't we just use our money? Yeah. So it's interesting when you talk about the uh, injury prevention research, I think, uh, you know, the common person will be like, oh, okay, so you're going to prevent people from tripping on sidewalks, you know. But that's the, the uh, injury prevention, you're, you're talking about much bigger and much more um, severe types of injuries. Well, the kinds that Deepika takes care of Harbor View, yeah. um, but they really vary. I mean, one of the things I'm most well known for is the fact that I show that bicycle helmets work and really develop a program to promote bicycle helmet use around the country. So I'm sure most of you wore bicycle helmets when you were younger, and that's because of the programs that we, we developed here in Seattle. And we could do a whole show now on the whole debate and the and the withdrawing of the requirements regarding bicycle helmets. We won't even helmets. go there. <laughs> That'll be for next that's, season. That's another story. <laughs> next season. All right, so we've talked about Harborview a couple of times, and for, for a few folks, they're very familiar with Harborview, maybe a family member or themselves, they've had to go there for something. but. But a lot of people don't know what Harborview is, and an astonishing number of people don't. So what's Harborview? What is it, what's the role it plays in our world, in our yes. community? So Harborview is a hospital in um, First Hill um, in Seattle. Um, and it was actually founded back in 1877, I believe, um, as a six-bed welfare hospital at a different location. And a few locations and chain moves um, led to the current site where the hospital is. And I think in the 1930s, um, the hospital sort of had a building there and established itself there. And Harborview is a county hospital. Um, it's a safety net hospital. Um, and we take care of everyone and anyone um, who needs care. Um, and um, one of, you know, I think a lot of hospitals have different focuses, um, and the, the true passion and focus of Harborview is taking care of injured patients. That's trauma patients and burn patients, and then we take care of other patients too. That's sort of the mission of the hospital, is taking care of injured patients really well um, and really striving to do that. Um, it is a teaching hospital, so we have medical students and trainees of various sorts who rotate through. Um, and when you think about trauma centers and hospitals, um, there's many across the country, and there's levels of, of designation based upon the expertise, the resources, the services, the sort of ability to take care of injured patients. And level one centers are sort of the highest level of care. Um, um, and Harborview is unique, and sort of the trauma system in the, in, in the um, Pacific Northwest is a bit unique in that Harborview is not just the only level one trauma center in the state of Washington, both adult and pediatric, um, but also in the five state whammy region. So that's Washington, Wyoming, um, Alaska, um, Montana, and Idaho. I don't. Thank you. <laughs> I knew it was like, oh my God! I should have been keeping yeah. track. Right. One of the letters is missing. I know. Which one? It's like yeah. which one? I don't. Yeah. One. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I know it's a it's a it's a really fun place to work if you like you know really want to be taking care of injured patients. Um, and it sounds like it can be a high action environment. Definitely is. Saturday night. 
Yeah. July 4th. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And you sort of never know, and it could be a random Thursday night, and certainly Friday night, Saturday night, summers in general tend to be, yeah. tend to be pretty busy and unpredictable. Then we could talk all about do not do the fireworks, yeah. be careful boating, all of the things. Uh, uh, let me ask, what does it mean to be then a trauma surgeon? Um, so um, as a trauma surgeon, um, take care of lots of injured patients. And those could be folks who are injured as a result of a car crash, a fall while hiking, or you know, an a injury related to violence like a stab or a gun-related injury. And um, what it really means is that you know, from, from when the patient sort of first comes into the hospital, you meet the patient in the emergency department, and, and trauma surgery is not a one surgeon or a one person sport, it is definitely a team effort, and there's an entire team of, of um, healthcare providers who sort of assemble at the bedside of an injured patient when they come in, and you sort of assess the patient, decide how sick or not sick they are and what they need. And sometimes they need imaging and sometimes they need to just be admitted. And sometimes they need an emergency surgery and a lot of blood because they're bleeding from something. And so at that point, at the, as a trauma surgeon, you take the patient to the operating room or you admit them to the hospital or to the intensive care unit and you manage their injuries. We as general trauma surgeons take care of um, injuries in the chest, the belly, extremities, but we also collaborate with neurosurgeons for head injuries, orthopedic surgeons for bony injuries, um, et cetera. Just like Gray's Anatomy. You know, oh, I, meant, I forgot to mention that. Harborview was the hospital that Gray's Anatomy was based on. Okay. So, yeah. sort of claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> Among many other I don't know things. that we want that one, but yeah. yeah, there you are. It's not not the same as Gray's Anatomy. Yeah. <laughs> so. Dr. Rivari, you said Abe Bergman called you, and it's interesting because I know Dr. Bergman as well, and that that, and is that the entry to gun violence prevention for you through the center? Yes, it was. Okay. And then for Dr. Nera, you, what's the connection? Is it just seeing these folks come through and trying to figure out what's going on here and what should we be doing about it? Yeah, I think, I think most trauma surgeons would, would say that they have some interest in this because you're taking care of these patients day in and day out, and I think a lot of times the injuries that they have feel like very preventable. And also when, when you take care of patients and you deal with their problem and you fix their bleeding and you get them to the point of discharge from the hospital, and, you know, the more we learn about what was going on that, that probably contributed to that injury happening in the first place and then sort of what, what life looks like after discharge from the hospital, after an injury, even that you survive that was gun related is really, I think, concerning. And I think that's sort of where my interest in, in this um, started. Okay. So let's put a pin in that, because we're going to come back to that, because that's, that's an intervention that, that um, we should unpack that a little bit more, because it's super interesting. So, so stepping back again, and you know, your doctors, I don't, I'm going to ask you this because you're in this, not because you're experts in statistics or anything, but in the United States, are we actually experiencing a surge in gun violence, or is it the media cycle that helps us think and feel like we're experiencing a surge? Or there is a we, surge. How do we untie? There is. There okay. is a surge. So, mm -hmm. back in like 2019, before the pandemic, there were about 39,000 people who died of firearm injuries each year in the United States. <clears throat> Last year, it was about 48,000. 39 to 48 in in three years. Yes. Yeah. So there has been this increase. Why has that increase happened? Um, a variety of reasons. Number one, during the pandemic, um, there was a huge increase in the number of people buying firearms. And we um, can trace that through the um, FBI has this background check system so they look at how many people buy firearms each day, each month. <clears throat> and there was a massive increase in the, in the number of people buying firearms during the pandemic. Um, there was an increase in unemployment, as we know. Um, disruption of basic routines, increase in substance abuse, as we know, and all of those have led to an increase in firearm violence. I think one of the things that it's important for, for you all to realize is that firearm violence is composed of different kinds of, of things. So we hear a lot about the mass shootings, which are terrible incidents, but they account for less than 1% of the deaths in the United States from firearms. In the state of, in the um, 
the United States as a whole, 60% of the firearm deaths are suicides. In the state of Washington, there's 75%. In Montana, there are about 80%. Mm -hmm. Accidental injuries, kids, you know, eight-year-olds getting a hold of dad's gun and shooting their friend, that happens. But it only happens about 800 to 1,000 times a year. And so those account for a really small portion. The homicides account for about a third of the firearm deaths. So it's a complex problem, and it's it's we. I know I and probably Deepka too. We are always upset when we hear about these mass shootings, they're terrible events. But in some ways, they take away attention from the problem of the everyday shootings that happen. Mm -hmm. Three hundred people each year in the United States get shot, um, and so you know it's those kinds of everyday events that we're really concerned about, obviously in addition to the, to the mass shootings. It's those everyday occurrences. And partly the reason that we've also seen this increase in gun violence is that now there's an estimated 400 million firearms in the United States in private hands. I say estimated because we don't really know. We know how many cars there are in the United States. We know how many cars there are in the state of Washington or in Seattle. But we don't have any idea how many firearms there are in the United States because the NRA has pretty much blocked the release of that data of purchasing and gun ownership and, and licensing. So it's really just we have these from, from polls and surveys. We don't really know how many firearms we have in the United States. So you, you did a great job there of breaking out that, that there are these different um, slices of the gun violence epidemic. And so that takes us to there are different interventions and responses to those if we, if we want to change those numbers. If we agree that we want to change the directions of all of that. Um, is, I, I should ask first, are those numbers, you, you cited a few of the states, is there anything different about other parts of the country in terms of the trends of those numbers? Is there, like in the southeast or? Uh, the the um, number of firearm deaths are directly related to the number of firearms in the community. I mean, it's almost a straight line relationship. And the number of firearms in the community is related to how restrictive or permissive the laws are in the, in the states. So the states that have the most permissive laws that allow pretty much anybody to buy a firearm are usually the southern states, Texas, um, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, but also Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, Idaho, South Dakota. The states that are, have the most restrictive laws are places like Hawaii, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and their rates of firearm ownership is much, much lower than it is um, in other parts of the country. We, as, um, Sally mentioned that she's part of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, which for the last 10 years has done an incredible job of working with um, the state legislature and citizens initiatives to really pass and have implemented a number of important firearm laws in the states. So I think we've gone from um, probably about a D or a D minus in terms of the effectiveness of firearm laws, and now we're close to an A or an A plus. You know, uh, for the title of this talk, we, uh, we did uh, uh, talk about the, the disease of gun violence, and that's very much part of the, part of the discussion about um, interrupting gun violence and treating it as a disease. And yesterday, I think it was yesterday, uh, KUOW had the piece really unpacking this, the language around the epidemiology of it. And is that, do we subscribe, do you all subscribe to that and why, how is that a good metaphor? Is it a metaphor or is it real? Um, and how does it, how does it help us understand what's happening here and then how we react to it? Yeah, I think I, I definitely agree with that. And I think that, you know, and Dr., like Dr. Rivera brought up, there's definitely different types of gun violence. And I think there's different risk factors and different sort of contributors to to suicide or you know, assault or interpersonal violence related gun injury or an accidental injury. And I think that um, certainly when you're thinking about um, what to do or how to address this or what things that you could be doing to make a difference, you have to sort of understand what's going on at baseline um, and then think about sort of strategies to, to intervene um, um, in your space or in different spaces. 
So I certainly do subscribe by that. Yeah, I, I think that in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a big move to, to really consider gun violence to be a public health problem, not just a criminal justice problem, but a public health problem. Because if look, think about it, there are 49,000 people dying each year in the United States from firearms. That's a public health problem. And for each person that's dying, there's two to three who are injured who are surviving and who are not just surviving. People don't just come in and have a gun-related injury and be discharged from the hospital and be fine, right? Um, um, they're oftentimes struggling after discharge. And so I think, and we don't even have an accurate count on the number of injuries because we don't have that at the national level. I think Dr. Rivera is working on that, and several leaders are sort of working on trying to make that available to us. But it would be great to talk about um, interventions or ideas about interventions that show promise in some area. Uh, there are a couple of a couple of things. So uh, media has highlighted the uh, intervention when someone is actually in the hospital, having a peer or someone who's a survivor actually approach them. Can we talk about that one? How does that one work, and, and why does why does it seem like it works? Do you want me to take yeah, that one out? Yeah, it's your program. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, I think that um, I think there's there's different parts to sort of the the work. There's definitely like a huge amount of work being done, and that needs to be done in the prevention side. Um, and that's in the community, addressing some of the risk factors, the contributors, identifying hotspots for violence, trying to intervene. Finding high-risk youth mentors, you know, um, al finding alternatives to violence, a huge amount of work that's being done, and I think that deserves a lot of credit. And then there's, there's the folks who get injured who are cared for in the hospital. Um, most of the people, luckily, who make it to the hospital survive um, their hospitalization. We lose about 10%, so... Um, um, not, you know, that's it's still concerning, but nine out of 10 folks who come into the hospital with a gun-related injury survive to hospital discharge. And I think that, you know, that moment in time um, during that hospitalization, there, there's an opportunity to um, create change or change someone's life trajectory. And this has been shown. It's called a teachable moment, meaning that there are things that you can do that might change that person's life um, and their life trajectory, and, and potentially even the lives and, and of the people around them, their family, their younger siblings, et cetera. But you know, me as a trauma surgeon going in and trying to have a conversation with a young kid who you know, lives in a, a, a specific community and has certain things going on in his life and trying to figure out what's going on, that doesn't work. I'm not a credible messenger in that way for him or her. And I think it's much more, more powerful to have someone who um, that individual can trust and relate to. Um, and that's where sort of peer support comes in. Um, having someone who has been impacted by gun violence, who has potentially survived gun violence themselves, and who kind of gets it, come in and talk to you. Um, and, and, and actually like give you space to talk you know, in confidence about what's going on. Um, um, and, and then to, to hopefully, you know, if, if you can make this work, and this is the goal with the sort of work we're trying to do at Harborview, is not just have that peer support in the hospital, but then sort of translate that into talking with that individual about what things are going on in their life that may have resulted in this event happening in the first place. And for the folks that are open to it, really trying to find ways to provide support that goes with them in that process of discharge from the hospital. And if you think about someone coming in with a gun-related injury to the hospital and being injured, um, think about how scary it must be to be then discharged from the hospital after your injury with new issues, potentially really serious, life-changing new issues, back into the same community and the same situation that you were injured in in the first place. That is really scary, I think. And there's a lot of potential to, to have a positive impact in that space. And that's what we're trying to do with peer support in the hospital, but also with partnerships with the community organizations that are in the community, really trying to work with individuals and, and high-risk youth, um, um, and really trying to connect our patients with those resources as they discharge from the hospital. 
And you, that's a great, um, you know, you mentioned a lot of the community organizations and, and off and on during the Louder Than Words series, we've had folks who have been connected to some of those organizations, either as speakers or, or in our audience. So um, uh, folks choose 180 is, is adjacent to that work, Community Passageways in that work, Rainier Beach Peacekeepers that have had different names with the Rainier Beach Action Coalition and others. So that prevention work um, on the ground seems incredibly difficult and really important to try to stop having that person have to pass through the doors at Harborview. But yeah, that, that question of you're going back into your community, you've been discharged, you likely have injuries that, are, that are, need time mm -hmm. um, and need further, further interventions, um, and you're back in that, in that environment. So, and is that, a, is that a study? Is that being, is that continue, that's, that's happening now, somebody's on call, somebody gets paged, to use the old term, they show up, they start, they start doing their thing, and someone's, someone's marking like, okay, is this making a difference? Yeah, so um, right now, it's, it's not a study. It's, it's sort of in the program development phase, and I think that, you know, when you're thinking about this work, we kind of felt like we needed to, like, build up the program and be able to provide the support and sort of build those relationships with our community partners and really really be able to connect people in the right ways and provide the support. And then we'd like to transition to looking at whether what we're doing is, is making a difference and sort of what the individual's experience is or thoughts are about it. What could we be doing better? What could we, should we be doing different? What's working um, um, and what's not working? And I think that's the phase that we're sort of um, um, hoping to transition to. Really the last two years that we've been working on this has been building up the right team, getting funding for the work um, um, and um, trying to get sort of um, our relationships with the community, trying to figure out who's out there already working in this space and trying to connect with them in a way that we can actually partner as a hospital with our community organizations who are in this space. Do you, do you get any resistance from those organizations? Like we can't be too tied to the to like something that looks official because we need to have our credibility with our community? Yeah, you know, it was less so that, but I will say that, you know, um, it is, um, it is really easy as a trauma center like Harborview to become somewhat disconnected from the community that you're in. And I think that you know there are things that happen that you don't realize happen that can fracture your relationship with the community. Mm -hmm. And I would say it took some time to really sort of be in that space and um, to learn about what folks were doing and to sort of build a relationship that was based on trust mm -hmm. um, both, both ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, we were really lucky to be able to be connected with several community organizations led by Community Passageways who together came together as a collective and said, look, we wanna address gun violence in King County. And we actually like, you know, based on our conversations with you, we want Harborview to be an active partner in that effort. And that's sort of how that um, I think came out. And we're kind of all learning together, the community organizations that are sort of partnering with us in this work and, and us. Um, I think there are a lot of us who are outside of that work, like way outside of that work, and have no credibility or standing in that work at all, who are just like, oh my god, please put down the guns. And that's probably not the effective message, is it? It probably isn't, but it's, it is important to think about why do people carry guns? Yeah. And, you know, the most common reason people own firearms is for protection. Um, some own them for hunting, um, for sports shooting, that sort of a thing. But by far and away, the most common reason people own firearms is for protection. And, you know, now with the last Supreme Court decision, Bruin, the ability to carry a firearm as a concealed weapon is probably now gonna be increased and in, in certainly a lot of states in the United States now allow that. You have to ask yourself, what can we do to change the feeling of people that they have to carry a weapon because they're afraid somebody's gonna harm them? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's really one of the real issues that we have to figure out in America. What can we do to have people feel safer and not have a weapon to feel safe? Because if you carry a weapon, 
we know that that's going to markedly increase your chances of, of shooting somebody else or being shot yourself. So we really need to think about that. And, you know, in, Dr. Nehru and I don't talk about you shouldn't own guns. It's really more how can you be a responsible gun owner and can you feel comfortable having your guns locked up and not that they're right there immediately at hand or they have to have them on your person or in your car. And when we talk about, earlier I talked about um, the fact that that 60% of firearm deaths in the United States are, are suicides. We talk now as physicians about lethal means safety. So when you see a patient in the emergency department that is suicidal, we ask them, have you, have any, have you developed plans for how you might harm yourself? Do you have firearms in your home or are they accessible to you? Because we know that if you try to take your life with a firearm, you will die 90% of the time. For instance, if you try to take your life with pills, you'll die 2% of the time. 2%, 90%. We buy it, we buy some time. Mm -hmm. So with pills, there's usually gonna be a second chance. Yeah. With the firearm, there's rarely a second chance. So that's why we talk about lethal means safety. and How can we help people through this crisis with their mental health problems, but at the same time, how can we prevent them from accessing something that they, in a, in a sort of spur of the moment decision, would use to take their lives. And I think right now about half of all suicides are gun related, so it's like a real problem. Can you talk, uh, how do issues, we can, get to, we can get to socioeconomics, but let's start with how do issues of, or, or presentation of race and gender affect Inter potential prevention or prevention or, or potential interventions in what you're seeing at this point? It's a complicated problem. Yeah. <laughs> complicated <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, we know that, that about half of the um, firearm deaths in women are related to intimate partner violence. And if you, if, it, if a user has a firearm, much more likely that woman is going to die you know, if the user doesn't have a firearm. We also know that for both the abusers and the victims of intimate partner violence, there's a really high risk of suicide. And about 10% of, of suicides um, to women are related to intimate partner violence. So, Intimate partner violence, women, firearms, there's really kind of a lethal combination there. I, I think the issue about race, um, you know, we, we live in a society that, that is racist and has a long history of racism. In a way that has occurred is that we have people living in poverty who have been deprived of all kinds of resources by people who are not black or not brown. Um, have those resources. And people that live in poverty um, are more likely to feel like they need to have weapons to, to protect themselves. And so we know that, that there is a much higher rate of firearm deaths. I mean, the highest rate of firearm deaths is in young black men, 15 to 29 years of age. That's really not because of their race, but because of their where they live and the, and the poverty that surrounds them. Yeah, and we and others have looked at this and looked at sort of community level factors, disadvantage, and the the rates of gun related injuries related to violence. So not suicides. If you're just talking about you know um, violence related um, gun um, deaths or injuries, and they are much higher in communities that are more vulnerable, more disadvantaged. Um, and that is where a lot of, a, a lot, a, a bigger percentage of the population is, you know, um, made up of people of color. So, again, same, same thing. Yeah, Deepika mentioned that she spent part of her life in St. Louis, and St. Louis has a very high rate of, of fire and homicide, and it's really concentrated in the most distressed, deprived communities within St. Louis. So it's not St. Louis as a whole, it's really where there's poverty and lack of opportunity for mm -hmm. people 
that's where the part of the violence is happening. This is a little bit in the weeds, but Deepika, I noticed that you're, you were part of a team that I think received a population health grant in this past cycle. And it's focused on support for spinal cord injuries for black and Latino individuals. Is that related to violence injuries? Does it come, does it, is it out of this work? Yeah, it is connected. This, that actually um, work was led by um, Heather Barnett. She's a, um, a physical medicine and rehab um, mm -hmm. physician. And what she was interested in was sort of in the same space that, that, that a lot of my interests lie, which is that, you know, not only are people who live in, in sort of um, um, uh, disadvantaged communities at higher risk for gun-related injury and death, but when they're injured and you discharge them back into the community, they do worse, which is not surprising, right, when you think about sort of the environment they're living in, the factors that, that were already at play, they don't go away. Those factors usually get worse. And now you add on like pain, like physical limitations, oftentimes like either new or exacerbated mental health problems like PTSD from the, from the event itself, et cetera. And, and you know, we know that's a problem. And, and then you, you think of sort of like, what is one of the worst injuries you could possibly have after a, um, a gun-related, you know, event um, um, and, you know, um, one that's going to impact your life in like a really, really real way. And that is one of those is a spinal cord injury, right? New paraplegia or quadriplegia is a huge problem. And we know that those patients need... Um, intense physical therapy, occupational therapy, you know, rehab services, et cetera, in order to have the best possible outcome in a really difficult situation. And what we found was that individuals at Harborview, cared for at Harborview, who had a uh, spinal cord injury that resulted from violence, which is usually a, a gun-related event, um, those individuals were significantly less likely to actually get rehab services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and be, occupational therapy, and be able to make it to their appointments. And so this effort is trying to take a deeper um, look into that to try to figure out what the what the driving factors are and how we might be able to to do things to get those folks the services that they need and really need in order to be able to have a reasonable outcome after their injury. That's a good one. Okay. If you have questions, please wave your hand. Are there, are there states or countries that are getting this close to right? And if so, what are they, what are they doing that's different than what we're doing in this country? It's, it's hard to compare our country to other countries because we have the Second Amendment. And we're really the only country in the world that kind of protects people um, or guarantees the people the right to own a firearm. And as a result, we have the highest rate of firearm ownership in the world. Um, if you look at firearm deaths, it seems like five countries in the world account for 50% of the firearm deaths, and the U.S. is the leader in that. You look at, like, Japan, there was a, a um, shooting in Japan of the prime minister a year or two ago, the number of firearm deaths in Japan each year is like less than 10. Wow. Wow. Total. Total. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like a, a bad weekend in Seattle. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's hard to make those kinds of comparisons. But there are programs that do work. And, you know, I, as a pediatrician, I believe that early childhood interventions are really critical. Um, we know that early childhood education, early childhood interventions can place a child on a trajectory that's going to be a trajectory of success, where they and their parents understand that this child can actually do well in school. They're going to be successful in school. And if they stay in school, they're going to be successful then in getting a, a job that will help them to support a family and not have to resort to other ways of supporting, supporting themselves. And there are programs in the United States that have really done that, the Nurse Family Partnership and other kinds of early childhood intervention programs that have been successful in doing that. So I think we can do that. I think that it's a matter of 
are we willing to place the priorities on something that the dividend is not going to be paid out for 20 years? Thank you both for coming. Um, my question, uh, Dr. Rivera, you mentioned um, part of thinking about this system is uh, trying to figure out why folks feel the need to carry guns to feel safe. And just thinking about our Letter Than Word series, uh, we had Chief Diaz here, and in thinking about our police system where our public safety officers also carry guns, I want to hear from both of you, like what are some challenges and some opportunities that you see and bringing like, the stakeholders together of the police departments, having Harborview on board, and having the community engaged in these conversations for preventing gun violence. What would you say to that? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think, it's, I think it's a, that's a great question um, with a not an easy answer. Um, I think you're absolutely right that, and, and just like Dr. Rivera said, that you know, understanding why someone is carrying a gun like is critical because like if you just go in and be like you shouldn't carry a gun you're going to be more likely to get re-injured as a result of it that's not going to work right um our, our violence intervention specialist actually sits down with patients and talks to them about their gun ownership um and talks to them about the reasons that are that are going into that and they are like multifactorial there's a lot of things going on and until you start addressing those issues um, you're not going to be able to just tell someone to, to not carry a gun if they feel like they need that for, for their own safety. And I think um, the solution is complex, and I think the solution involves deep investment in communities and individuals and programs um, that create opportunity, that uplift communities that are, that are currently um, experiencing disadvantage and structural racism. And I think that requires collaboration and trust between our police force our community partners, our hospitals, our entire community. And I think we really have to be able to, to bring those folks together. Chief Diaz has actually been a wonderful partner in the work that we're doing at Harborview in partnership with our community organizations. And like that, that sort of conversation and, and, and that talk is actually happening, which is really exciting. And that's not a fix in and of itself, but at least, at least we're talking. Chief, Chief Diaz is a good guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He, he really guy. is, and, yeah. and you know, I think that the police want to do the right thing. They want to protect the citizens in the community, and I think we have to talk with them about how's the best way to do that. I think there's a, the other dynamic that that we think about, uh, and that a bunch of us kind of assume comes into play with it, but we have no idea. So the reasons people carry, or the reasons um, that people feel more protected or stronger if they're carrying, also get wound up with how. Uh, power gets reflected in um, movies, in music, mm -hmm. in television, in, in all of these kinds of signposts. And so figuring out, you know, can we have a community dialogue that helps to change culture over time? There are all these other widely dispersed and, and differentially controlled sources that, uh, that normalize mm -hmm. violence to a great, right. de great degree and normalize Mm -hmm. Gun violence, and I know this is an age-old thing about does TV matter, do movies matter, but I think for a lot of us, it's kind of hard to it's hard to look at it and say, God, it's got to matter a little bit, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it does. But you know, I, I I think that you know we're almost at the end of the hour here, and I, I think it's well, that it, means he's going to do something now. But no, <laughs> now we're in trouble. I think it's important <laughs> that we don't leave here thinking the problem is hopeless. Mm -mm. It really isn't. I think there are things that we can do. The program that Dr. Vera has at Harborview is really a great example of there are things that we can do to help people even after they've been shot. There are th laws that we have passed in this state, like the red flag laws. I mean, how many of you know what a red flag law is? So just a couple of people. It's called the extreme risk protection law. It's a law where, say you have a loved one or a partner, who may not be so loved, but um, who is at risk of harming themselves or others with the firearm they own. The law allows you to go to a judge and have a hearing and have that firearm taken away from that individual. 
that would protect the individual as well as uh, the people around them. So that's a great example of how this law that was really at the instigation of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, that one law really can make a difference in what we see in our community. We have a law now requiring firearms to be securely stored. That can make a difference. You know, if we know that, that these firearms are not going to get into the hands of, of teenagers, which can then steal them or use them to harm themselves or others. We have the ability to have firearms stored outside the home if somebody's in a state of crisis. Um, to weather that period of a few weeks until they get mental health help. So there are things that we can do, and I think that we as a community need to really look at those kinds of things and say, yes, this is a big problem, but there are things we as a community can do to, to help solve that. I completely agree. And I think a lot of times people say, you know, like, for programs, and Harvard is not the only place that has a violence intervention program, but like, you know, is it really practical to be like focusing on individuals and one person at a time trying to make a difference? And I always say, don't, I, I don't think we should ever underestimate the, the impact that changing one person's life can have on that family or that community. And I think seeing folks, you know, recover and come through and then do something really awesome with their lives has a huge impact on, on that community and the folks around them and their friends and their, their siblings. Um, and so I think that I, I totally agree. I think that there are lots of things that we can do. And, and sometimes these seemingly small things that we're doing to intervene in individuals' lives can actually have a big impact. Are there other things that you are seeing or that you're thinking about that are the next things you want to try? I think one of the things we are trying to look at with the firearm program at Harborview in the university is trying to look at <coughs> excuse me, which laws matter, which laws make a difference. So, you know, the NRA says, well, we have a lot of laws. And they're right. We do have a lot of laws. But we really need to look at what are the laws that really are going to make a difference and then try to make sure that we have those laws in our state and make sure they're enforced. I mean, one of the big problems is, is that there are places in this state which refuse to enforce some of these laws that we have. And so we need to look at those carefully and, and really push the, the enforcement of those kinds of laws that will make a difference. Because they, they will make a difference. If you look at firearm deaths in a place like Massachusetts, which has strong gun laws, compared to Louisiana, which has weak gun laws, I mean, they differ by a factor of like five because of those laws. Yeah, um, and I think um, thinking about sort of um, the communities that we serve, one of the things I think that really matters, and I think Dr. Rivera talked about this earlier, is like childhood opportunity. I think people don't choose violence, right? They, they, they come to violence because of a lack of other opportunity. Um, um, and I think that there's, there's um, a lot of potential with mentorship and I think some of the community partners that we were working with are really mentors to, to high-risk youth in the community, which I think is really powerful. But you know, you think about sort of some of the most um, disadvantaged communities and, and kids in those communities, and and really trying to find ways to create mentorship. And um, we've talked about ways to bring some of the the um, youth that are served by our community partners into the hospital and to really create mentorship and to show them that, you know, like they can work in this space. They can, they can be a peer support individual. They can be a trauma surgeon and really exposing them to things that they may not otherwise be exposed to and might, might not actually think are, are realistic, real possibility for them. And so we're trying to work on some programs to really bring the community into the hospital in that way. I love that. Uh and I will say just like both of you sharing kind of how you got into the work that you are doing now, I think is really powerful for um, folks who are here tonight and folks who will, will download, download this. They will have trouble following your path. They'll need a globe, but it'll work. <laughs> I think what you're- I wouldn't really, recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of time zone changes. Yes, yes, um, yes. I think what you're describing also in terms of let's, let's not underestimate the individual intervention, the individual change in someone's life and their family and their community as a result of that, as well as what is the community-wide strategy, what is the community-wide investment in change and in opportunity. Uh, that is a lovely 
point to put on tonight's discussion because Ed, it takes us also back to our very first discussion in the Louder Than Words series with Dr. Ben Danielson, who uh, didn't come necessarily to talk about pediatrics. He came to talk about community development. He came to talk about how do we change the broader strokes mm -hmm. and the broader landscape in which these challenges are manifest. Mm -hmm. um, they, don't, they don't happen without those community dynamics. So let's talk about those community dynamics and talk a lot about um, opportunity for youth. How do we create that in order to change the trajectory in that way? And with that, unless I have missed any hands, and I do not think that I have, I think that brings us to our end for tonight. Let's give an initial round of applause <laughs> to <laughs> Dr. Nira, Dr. Rivara, and, and Sally. Um, you, you took us through really difficult and complex terrain and, and led us toward this light that, that, there's, that there's hope in this. And part of the hope that I found in this is just the ability to be able to talk about a set of issues that are remarkably complex in our, in our nation and perhaps in our world. And, uh, and first, I want to thank you for the manner in which you've led us here. I want to thank you for the work that you do at Harborview. For those of you who, who haven't seen or been to Harborview or haven't had a chance to research Harborview, there's no more important work. And I think the thing that you said at the very beginning, um, whosoever will let them come is going to be served with this kind of, of just excellence and care, no matter where you come from, no matter who you are. Heroic work being done there. And, and finally, you're modeling something which is really important, which is day-to-day -day citizens. And I'll say to our students, you, you've got people that you should aspire to be like. Um, they're in their professional work, in their ideation, in the manner in which they walk in, in the world, you've inspired us. So you've taken a, a topic that is really complicated and left us with a sense of hope, which is far more than we could have asked for. So Sally, Dr. Nero, Dr. Rivara, let's give a final applause for our final um, Louder Than Words event. Thank you. <laughs>